This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. And if you're just tuning in, it's our weekly news recap where we make sense of the week's top local and state stories. Now, before the break, we talked about state politics and the November election. There's a lot more to get to. A special judge granted a preliminary injunction on Indiana's new abortion law. Tonight, Chicago taxpayers are on the hook for $25 million to settle lawsuits against Chicago police. The city's council finance committee approved the payouts over three lawsuits accusing officers of misconduct. Timmy Knudsen will replace former Alderman Michelle Smith, who stepped down last month. He was just sworn in to represent the North Side Ward. Our panel, Chicago Tribune state government reporter Dan Petrella, Aaron Hegarty, a city hall reporter for The Daily Line, and NBC5 Chicago reporter Christian Farr. We are still live right now on Facebook and YouTube for those of you who prefer to watch. All right, residents of Lincoln Park, Old Town, and the Gold Coast, they've got a new alderman. Aaron, tell us all about Timmy Knudsen. They do. So um, on Monday, Mayor Lori Lightfoot announced that Timmy Knudsen, uh, I guess now former head of the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, would be the new 43rd Ward Alderman. Um, He replaces Michelle Smith, who announced right after the July City Council meeting that she would be retiring, and she left um, last month. So Knudsen is one of 17 people who applied um, for this job. That was a pretty quick replacement. um, Yeah, I don't know. I was on the edge of my seat, so it seemed like it took forever. <laughs> I'm like, that was super fast. You're like, right. no, it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I believe with this swearing in, he's the youngest member of the city council, um, taking the place of um, Alderman uh, Carlos Ramirez Rosa, who I think is older than him by about a, a year, potentially. Um, he's the seventh member of the city council's LGBTQ caucus, um, and he noted um, a few times on Wednesday that he is also the first openly gay mayor, openly gay city council person of the 43rd Ward. Um, he said he wants to use his experiences as a member of the LGBTQ community to, you know, affect change, relate to people. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's also uh, a lawyer. And he said, you know, he's worked as a grassroots organizer in the 43rd Ward. Um, Do you have any sense as to why the mayor picked him? Um, I mean, he was, you know, the head of the Zoning Board of Appeals. It kind of comes with, you know, he's not unknown. Yeah. Um, I think he looks like a good choice. Um, <laughs> on paper? Know, yeah, on paper. <laughs> um, and he said, you know, on Wednesday, he has a, quote, you know, proven track record of being, of bringing the private sector results into the public sector, into the public service. Um and it, it was kind of funny during his swearing in, you know, aldermen were congratulating him and calling him Tim. Um, and he was very clear that his name is Timmy, not Tim. Oh, okay. Um, as, you know, some aldermen make a note. joke that... Reporters make notes. <laughs> I'm making notes right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he was also assigned to his city council committees, which are pretty big, powerful committees since he's just replacing um, alderman Michelle Smith. And some aldermen had some... Uh, kind of qualms with that. Some aldermen who were elected in 2019 who are on kind of more low uh, committees, like this, you know, special events committee. Yeah. Um, they said, you know, you're bringing him in and he gets to be on public safety. He gets to make decisions on the budget. Um, maybe mm. you sh- should reconsider how these committees are signed. So I thought that was um, kind interesting. of interesting. And there's going to be an election in February for this ward, for the 40, 43rd ward. After this mayoral appointment, Dan, do you think that it's likely that Knudsen will win? Um, you know, there's always the, the advantage of being the incumbent. Your name is in the news for a few months before voters really start turning their attention to those yeah. elections. Um, so I think, you know, that, that's always a little bit of an, an inherent advantage. I think, you know, unless some he screws it up somehow over the next yeah. few months, he's probably got a, a pretty good shot. Yeah, for sure. And as aldermen are set to receive near 10 percent salary increases next year, there's a few that are now calling for limiting their pay. Christian, can you imagine asking for a limit on your salary? <laughs> <laughs> My boss could be listening, so I just want to be careful with that. Dan? Um, <laughs> um, no. <laughs> I'll be honest. No, I cannot. The answer is um, no's all around. Yeah, then, yeah. <laughs> yeah no. I mean, the issue of public official never. pay is just always No, limiting. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a more vocabulary. So. <laughs> right. Why are these aldermen doing this, Aaron? Make it make sense. Well, you know, some I think a lot of aldermen would agree with both of you that they don't want to set a limit on on their salary or how much 
you know, how big of a raise they can get each year. And that's why, so on Wednesday, there were three proposals introduced relating to aldermanic pay and, and pay raises. Um, Alderman Greg Mitchell sent two of those measures to the Rules Committee, essentially saying, we're not going to discuss these or vote on these ever or for a long time. Um, one of them was from Alderman uh, Andre Vasquez, who wants to cap um, aldermanic pay increases at 5%. Um, each year. So right now they're tied to CPI, which is why you see this nearly 10% raise. And one issue that Vasquez brought up is right now it's take it or leave it. You either take this massive pay increase, which, you know, right before an election year doesn't look great, um, or you don't take a raise at all. He wants something kind of in between or mm. to kind of put, yeah, put a cap on on pay increases. Um, another proposal would, from Alderman Raymond Lopez, who is also running for mayor, um, it would reset aldermanic salaries at 120000 and uh, would provide a 3% pay raise every four years. So that's also how long aldermanic terms are. Okay. Um, I, I don't envision anyone Voting. latching on to that proposal. <laughs> yeah. That one seems highly unlikely. This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. We're going behind the headlines in the weekly news recap with Aaron Hegarty, City Hall reporter for The Daily Line, NBC5 Chicago reporter Christian Farr, and Dan Petrella, uh, state government reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Reminder, if you're watching us online right now on the WBEZ YouTube page, you can chat with us in the chat box. I might just read your comment or question on the air. Like Angela, who's on YouTube right now, she asks, what do aldermen make now? It's a range. So not all aldermen make the same amount currently, um, specifically because you see that aldermen can take this, take their annual pay increase or decline it. So there were, I, I think, 17 who declined um, the upcoming pay increase. Um, so right now it's between a little over $120,000 and more than $142,000. So, I mean, it, it doesn't range that widely, but um, yeah, not not everyone makes the same. And the same. Some of that is by their own choice. Mm-hmm. Uh, sticking with you for a bit, Aaron, City Council also approved three police misconduct settlements this week. What is that going to cost taxpayers? So that's going to cost about uh, $25 million for these settlements um, alone. The largest was $15 million, which was awarded for the family of Guadalupe Franco Martinez, Um, She was killed in 2020 when a Chicago police uh, squad car crashed into her vehicle near Ashland and Irving Park. Mm. Um, That police vehicle was involved in a high speed chase. Um, And it it's just kind of tragic, you know, hearing the family that she left behind. And, you know, police were in pursuit of a person who was wanted for crimes committed, I believe, in the suburbs. Um, When the car hit Martinez's um, car, it, it burst into flames and she had to be. Um, extricated. Um, the lawsuit was brought by her family, um, who alleges that police were in the chase, were acting um, under willful and wanton conduct while driving at the high high rates of speed. Yeah. Um, one uh, nine Alderman, million for another one. Yeah, nine million for another one. That was a wrongful conviction, wrongful murder conviction of Patrick Prince, and then probably part of an image that's going to be ingrained in my head for quite some time was a uh, $900,000 payment to settle the lawsuit brought by Dwayne Rowlett, who was seriously wounded in 2017 um, after Chicago police shot him um, as they alleged he resisted arrest and that he had a gun. He didn't have a gun, but he had at least one knife with him. And Mm. because of that... um, uh, so this led Alderman Nick Spasato to bring with him to City Hall on City Council floor an example of a knife approximately the same size that Rowlett allegedly had. And so we had uh, an alderman on Wednesday holding a, a knife on City Council floor uh, and trying that is the to visual that convince you know. oh, his boy. colleagues to vote against this settlement. So, so yeah, this is a lot of money for taxpayers, um, $25 million for just... You know, yeah. something that could have been potentially prevented and, you know, aldermen trying to argue against uh, these settlements. Before I take you out the hot seat for a sec, uh, City Council also approved a measure to protect abortion access. What are the details there? Um, so this would protect largely people who are coming from out of state for abortion access and gender affirming care. Um, I think 
you know, Alderman and, and the mayor wanted this to be enshrined in um, specific language, um, especially as you see, you know, neighboring states are people from neighboring states have to come to Chicago and, and Illinois for for this care. So they want to ensure that, um, you know, people can come here and get the care they need and mm-hmm. return to um, their homes and not be I don't know, ratted out or, or yeah. punished for, for coming here. Well, speaking of neighboring states, Christian, a, a judge yesterday blocked Indiana's week old abortion law. So that didn't last very long. What's the latest there? No, it did not. That was a judge uh, in um, in the Indianapolis area who um, he blocked it uh, because there had been clinics um, that had come with a lawsuit to stop this from happening. And so a week ago, we know that it went into effect. And a lot of these clinics, I uh, believe it's about seven of them, uh, very concerned. They shut down operations, actually, even I think believe prior to that. One doctor we talked to was a Katie uh, McHugh, who is from Indiana. Uh, she uh, believes in safe abortions, had her own abortion clinic, and was planning to pack up and leave uh, Indiana mm. um, and just uh, have a small practice in um, the Indiana area and was uh, thinking of possibly even moving her whole entire family. Um, you know, she's she's pl- pleased with this. Um I didn't get the chance to speak with her after this ban was lifted, mm-hmm. um, but it was reported that um, you know people are getting the word that abortion is now legal again, and people are ready to get their health care that they deserve and that they desire. And you know her big thing was uh, she felt that her daughter was losing rights um, when yeah. that ban went into effect, and that ban went very quickly. I mean, that was a, a it was a special session that came in, and within two weeks they had put this in place. Um, and so there was a lot of concern. Planned Parenthood had had uh, put this lawsuit um, ahead, and, and other clinics had latched onto it as well. And so they're pleased right now, but we have to wait and see what's going to happen. I mean, it's just lifted right now, but there's you know still more hearings to come. I mm-hmm. believe in October that you know could lead to this coming back. So it's going to be a fight. But and this is a good sign, right? It's a good sign, but even the um, you know um, anti-abortion people were uh, not even happy with the ban that's in place. Um, to the point that Aaron was bringing up, they don't want people going to other states to get abortions. They want to be able to rat those people out as well. So they want a 100% abortion ban. And the one in Indiana was probably somewhere around 98%, oh, I see. you know, because you could still leave the state and get an abortion. And then there's also, you know, other limits uh, and other exclusions for people who can get abortions. So they want an, a 100%. So not everybody's happy with this. Um, but um, probably those anti-abortionists who I haven't been able to speak to yet since this ban's been lifted, probably really, really upset now um, because those um, abortions can resume. Do you think that we're going to be hearing more about abortion statewide, Dan, leading up to the uh, election in November? Absolutely. I think that is um, what Democrats have identified as one of the top winning issues for them with voters in November, especially with um, all that's swirling around on crime and the new issues of corruption that they Mm -hmm. have to deal with. Um, You know, you look to the referendum that happened in Kansas in the primary earlier this summer where voters in a pretty deep red conservative state rejected an amendment to the state constitution that would have allowed lawmakers to enact an abortion ban. You look at some of the other um, special elections, like the one in Alaska and New York that have taken place where where, um, pro-abortion rights candidates have performed much better than people expected. Um, I think this is really a very winning issue, even if we go back to um, Senator Hastings, who we discussed earlier, and his his response to um, Governor Pritzker calling for his resignation yesterday was, uh, you know, it's up to the voters to decide my fate, and they should elect you know, me, a longtime, you know, army veteran, a longtime senator and somebody who was going to defend a woman's right to choose. So, yeah, you can just see, um, you know, one of the things I'm watching to see is whether you mentioned the special session in Indiana, whether Illinois ever gets around to uh, having the special That's session right, that yeah. they said they were going to have back on the day that the decision came down. Almost from forgot Court. about yes. that. Hmm. Um, I think they're hoping that people will have forgotten that they said that was going to happen. <laughs> Yeah. You know what? Uh, The police misconduct settlements that we were just talking about a moment ago, Aaron, we got a question on YouTube from Sarah Berger. She says, why can't that lawsuit money come from police pensions? I don't know. (laughs) Um, It's it's a good question. question. That's a great question. (laughs) That $25 million, she says, could help a lot of communities. Yeah. It could. Good point, Sarah. I will will say, Alderman... uh, I think, I don't know if I mentioned this, Jason Irvin, um, during committee discussion, kind of asked, like, 
when are officers going to be held liable for instances like this where they are, you know, traveling at high rates of speed on in police chases? Um, that question is kind of unanswered. And, you know, the city said we're looking into this. But um, that, you know, that is a question. Should officers be held liable for? Um, yeah, it's a good thought. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually interesting, if I may interject. Oh, it for sure. goes back to the Safety Act earlier because one of the things that they were talking about while that was being debated in the legislature was um, eliminating something called qualified immunity, which protects mm-hmm. police officers from being the target individually of civil lawsuits. Yeah. And opponents of the bill managed to get that taken out before it was passed. So um, that just goes to show that there was some negotiation, there was some give and take on that bill, despite what um, what the critics are saying now. Let's take a pause. That is the Chicago Tribune's Dan Petrella. And we've got NBC5's Christian Farr and The Daily Line's Aaron Hegarty. We'll be back with more of the weekly news recap in just a moment. But first, over to Lisa Labas. Hurricane Fiona is expected to reach Canada later today.